as long as I've been here at 60 Minutes, I've wanted to interview Bob Dylan. Over his 43-year career, there is no musician alive who has been more influential. His distinctive twang and poetic lyrics have produced some of the most memorable songs ever written. In the 60s, his songs of protest and turmoil spoke to an entire generation. While his life has been the subject of endless interpretation, he's been largely silent. Now at age 63, he's written a memoir called Chronicles, Volume 1. And I finally got to sit down with him in his first television interview in nearly 20 years. What you will see is pure Dylan, mysterious, elusive, fascinating, just like his... You wrote Blowing in the Wind in 10 minutes, is that right? Probably. Just like that? Yeah. Where did it come from? It just came... It came from, uh, it was like, um, right out of that wellspring of uh, creativity, I would think, you know? That wellspring of creativity has sustained Bob Dylan for more than four decades. Hey, Mr. Time, the rain man, bless And produced 500 songs. You got a lot I knew. And more than 40 albums. You ever look at music that you've written and look mm -hmm. back at it and say, whoa, that mm -hmm. surprised me? I used to. Uh, I, I, I don't do that anymore. Uh, I don't know how I got to, to write those songs. What do you mean you don't know how? Well, those early songs were like almost magically written. Um, uh, darkness at the break of noon, shadows even the silver spoon. A handmade blade, a child's balloon. Eclipses both the sun and moon to understand you knew too soon there is no sense in trying. This Dylan classic, It's All Right, Ma, was written in 1964. The hollow horn plays wasted words, proves to warn that he not busy being born is busy dying. Well, try to sit down and write something like that. Uh, th there's a magic to that. And it's not uh, Siegfried and Roy kind of magic, you know. It's a it's a different kind of a penetrating magic. And uh, you know, I did it. I, I I did it at one time. You don't think you can do it today? Mm -mm. Does that disappoint you? Well, you can't do something forever. And uh, I did it once, and I can do other things now, but I I, I can't do that. Dylan has been writing music since he was a teenager in the remote town of Hibbing, Minnesota, the eldest of two sons of Abraham and Beatty Zimmerman. Did you have a good life, a good, uh, happy childhood growing up? I, I really didn't consider myself happy or unhappy. I always knew that there was something out there that um, uh, I needed to get to, and it, it wasn't where I was at that particular moment. It wasn't in Minnesota? No. It was in New York City. As he writes in his book, he came alive when at age 19, he moved to Greenwich Village, which at the time was the frenetic center of the 60s counterculture. Within months, he had signed a recording contract with Columbia Records. You referred to New York as the capital of the world. But when you told your father that, he thought that it, it was a joke. It, did your parents approve of you being a singer, a songwriter, going to New York? No, uh, the, the, they wouldn't have, have wanted that uh, for me, but uh, my parents never went anywhere. My father probably thought the capital of the world was where, wherever he was at the time. It couldn't possibly be where any, you know, any place else where he and his wife were in their own home. That to them was the capital of the world. What made you different? What pushed you out of there? Well, I listened to the radio a lot. I hung out in record stores and I slam banged around on a guitar and played the piano and and uh, learned songs from uh, a world which didn't exist around me. He says even then he knew he was destined to become a music legend. I was heading for the fantastic lights, he writes. Destiny was looking right at me and nobody else. Use the word destiny over and over throughout the book. What, what does that mean to you? It, it's a feeling you have that you know something about yourself nobody else does. The picture you have in your mind of what you're about will come true. 
it's kind of a thing you kind of have to keep to your own self because it's a fragile feeling and you put it out there and somebody will kill it. So it's best to keep that all inside. When we asked him why he changed his name, he said that was destiny too. So you didn't see yourself as, as Robert Zimmerman? And for some reason, you know, I never did. E even before you started performing? No, even then. Some people get born, you know, to the wrong names, wrong parents. I mean, that happens. Tell me how you decided on Bob Dylan. You, you call yourself what you want to call yourself. This is, this is the land of the free. Bob Dylan created a world inspired by old folk music with piercing and poetic lyrics, as in songs like A Hard Rain's Gonna Fall. So guns and sharp swords in the hands of young children. And songs that reflected the tension and unrest of the civil rights and anti-war movements of the 60s. It was an explosive mixture that turned Dylan, by age 25, into a cultural and political icon, playing to sold-out concert halls around the world and followed by people wherever he went. He was called the voice of his generation and was actually referred to as a prophet, a messiah. Go, driver, go. Yet he saw himself simply as a musician. You feel like a, an imposter uh, when, when, when you're supposed when, when someone thinks you're something and you're, and you're not. What, what was the image that people had of you and what was the reality? The image of me was certainly not a, a songwriter or a singer. It was more like some kind of a threat to society in some kind of way. What was the toughest part for you personally? It was like being in an Edgar Allan Poe story. You're just not that person everybody thinks you are, although they call you that all the time. You're the prophet, you're the uh, savior. I never I wanted to be a prophet or... Or, or, or savior, you know, Elvis maybe. Well, I could easily see myself becoming him, but prophet, no. I, I know that, and I accept, you don't see yourself as the voice of that generation, but some of your songs did stop people cold, and they saw them as, as, as anthems, and they saw them as protest songs. It was important in their lives. It sparked a movement. If your time to you is worth saving, then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone for the times they are changing. I mean, you may not have seen it that way, but that's the way it was for them. How, how do you reconcile those two things? My stuff were, were, were songs, you know, they, they weren't sermons. If you ex examine the songs, I don't believe you're going to find anything in there that says that I'm a spokesman for anybody or anything, really. But they saw it. Yeah, but That's no, but they, 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 they must not have heard the songs. It's ironic, you know, that the way that people viewed you was just the polar opposite of the way you viewed yourself. Isn't that something? Dylan did almost anything to shatter the lofty image many people had of him. He writes that he intentionally made bad records, once poured whiskey over his head in public, and as a stunt, he went to Israel and made a point of having his picture taken at the Wailing Wall wearing a skull cap. When you went to Israel, you wrote that the newspapers changed me overnight into a Zionist, and, and this helped a little. How, how did it help? Look, if the common perception of me out there in the public I was that I was either a drunk or I was a or a sicko, or a Zionist, or, or, or a Buddhist, or a Catholic, or, or a Mormon. Uh, all, all of this was better than uh, Archbishop of Anarchy. The spokesman for the generation. Yeah. Opposed to everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was especially opposed to the media, which he says was always trying to pin him down. Do you think of yourself primarily as a singer or as a poet? Well, I think of myself more as a song and dance man, you know. <laughs> let, let me talk a little bit about your relationship with the media. You wrote the press. I figured you lied to it. Why? I realized at the time that the press, the media, that's not the judge. God's the judge. The only person you have to think about lying twice to is either yourself or to God. The press isn't either of them. And uh, I just figured it irrelevant. 
Bob Dylan tried to run away from all of that in the mid-60s. He retreated with his wife and three young children to Woodstock, New York. But even there, he couldn't escape the legions of fans who descended on his home begging for an audience with the legend himself. So people would actually come to the house? Uh-huh. And, and do what? Want to discuss things with me, politics and philosophy and organic farming and things, you know. What did you know about organic farming? Nothing. Not uh, a thing. What did you mean when you wrote that, that the funny thing about fame is that nobody believes it's you? People will, uh, they'll, they'll say, uh, are you, uh, well, I think you are, and you'll say, I, I, I don't know, you know, and they'll say, you're, you're him, and you say, okay, you know, that, uh, yes. I said, and then the next thing, I'm saying, well, are, no, you know, like, like, are you really him? You're not him. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, that can go on and on. You go out to restaurants now? I don't like to eat in restaurants. Because people come up and say, are you him? The, the, that's always going to happen, yeah. Do you ever get used to it? No. At his peak, fame was taking its toll on Bob Dylan. He was heading towards a divorce from his wife, Sarah. And my wife, when she married me, had no idea of what she was getting into. Well, she was with me back then through thick and thin, you know? It, it just wasn't the kind of life that uh, she had ever envisioned for herself, any more than the kind of life that I was living that I had envisioned for mine. By the mid-1980s, he felt he was burned out and over the hill. You, you also wrote that I'm a 60s troubadour, a folk rock relic, a wordsmith from bygone days. I'm in the bottomless pit of cultural oblivion. Those are pretty harsh words. Well, I'd seen all these titles written about me. You know. And you started to believe it? Well, I believed it anyway. You know, um, I wasn't getting any thrill out of performing. I thought it might be time to close it up, you know? You really thought about quitting, folding up to tent? I had thought I'd just put it away for a while. But, but uh, then I started thinking, that's nah, enough, you know? But within a few years, Dylan told us he recaptured his creative spark and he went back on the road. Performing more than 100 concerts a year. And the album of the year is... In 1998, he won three Grammy Awards. Time out of mind. <laughs> At age 63, Bob Dylan remains a voice as unique and powerful as any there has ever been in American music. His fellow musicians paid tribute to him when he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, joining him in a rousing rendition of his most famous song. As you probably know, Rolling Stone magazine just named your song, Like a Rolling Stone, the number one song of all time. 12 of your songs are in their, in their list of the top 500. That must be good to have as, as part of your legacy. Oh, maybe this week, but, but you know, on, on the lists, they, they change names and, you know, quite frequently, really, I don't really pay much attention to that. But it's a pat on the back, huh? This week it is, but, you know, Who's to say how long that's going to last? Well, it's lasted a long time for you. I mean, you're still out here doing these songs, you know, you're still on tour. I do, but I don't take it for granted. Why do you still do it? Why are you still out here? Well, it goes back to the destiny thing. I mean, I made a bargain with it, you know, a long time ago, and I'm holding up my end. What was your bargain? To get where, um, I am now. Sh should I ask who you made the bargain with? <laughs> with, 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 you know, with the chief, uh, chief commander. On this earth? <laughs> and on this earth and in, uh, and then in a world we can't see. Bob Dylan has been nominated this year for the Nobel Prize in Literature for his songwriting. His new book has been a bestseller for the past seven weeks. It was published by Simon & Schuster, which is owned by Viacom, the parent company of CBS. 
Dylan is planning to write two more volumes of his memoirs.